الحمد لله وكفى والصلاة والسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى خصوصا على أفضلهم مخاتم النبيين محمد الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وبعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ونزلنا عليك الكتابة بيانا لكل شيء وهدى ورحمة وبشرى للمسلمين صدق الله العظيم We begin with Allah's blessed name We praise Him and we glorify Him as He ought to be praised and glorified and we pray for peace and for blessings on all his noble messengers and in particular on the last of them all the blessed prophet muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam as we greet you in the city of nottingham in britain with assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh i am delighted that we uh, started on time, exactly seven o'clock. That's a good sign. That's a good sign. Uh, our topic is one of tremendous importance: knowledge, the system of education, and the job. And uh, tonight, we will look at the knowledge and the system of education in our civilization. <coughs> Uh, particularly as it affects the child and the adolescent until he reaches to become the other, the process of learning. Uh, but tomorrow night we would like to look at the house of knowledge in Islam, higher Islamic learning, uh, because uh, it is my opinion at the age of 80. I used to say 77 until I got a knock on my head. The Quran knocked me on my head and said to me, but Allah says that he gave you the moon. لِتَعَلَمُوا عَدَدَ السِّنِينَ that you would count the years with the moon. So Imran, how come you're using the sun? So I got the knock on my head. So I'm now 80 years of age by the moon. And uh, I have located uh, um, this conclusion that the world of Islamic scholarship, our Ulama, our Maulanas and uh, Shuyukh and uh, Muftis, Ustaz, etc. While there is still so much sincerity and dedication in their ranks, they have not succeeded in responding to the challenges of this age in which we live. They don't even understand. They don't even understand the age in which we live far less to be able to respond to it. And this has been a, 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 a devastating state for us. It has led to our collapse as a civilization because our ulama have failed us in respect of this subject. To understand the reality which confronts us today and to go to the Quran to respond to that reality. Is there anyone here present who would defer with me that the most critically important issue facing the world of Islam today, no, more than that, the whole world is the subject of money. The subject of money. And money is not only the banking system, it is also the monetary system. People don't even know what I'm talking about. They don't even know what I'm talking about when I use the word the monetary system. <laughs> this is the most critically important subject of all facing this Ummah and facing mankind today. 
And has the Darul Loom contributed even this much to the study of the subject and to responding to what is Pakistan's most critical moment today in its history? Nothing from the Darul Loom, nothing from the scholars of Islam, nothing at all. But it's worse than that. Because Allah has been kind to me, and I have been able to study the subject and from the Quran to be able not only to explain but also to offer guidance. Imagine my astonishment when I find that they will not only not accept what I'm teaching but also reject me and call me names and uh, shut the doors of the masjid on me. And so we are certainly in a very, very dangerous situation today. And no amount of boxing gloves, Deobandi, Brelvi, Sufi, Salafi, this, that boxing match is going to change our condition. No. And so tomorrow we will look at the house of knowledge in Islam which is producing our scholars. And then on the, the day of Juma, I don't call it Friday, because you may not be aware of it, Friday is the day for the worship of a Scandinavian, a Scandinavian goddess named Fry. Yes, so uh, I, I prefer to use the name Yomul Juma, Juma Kadin. So on on uh, Juma, Yom Juma, uh, in Leicester, and I understand Leicester is less than one hour from Nottingham. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I will be speaking on uh, the Quran and uh, how to begin with the Quran to reconstruct the house of knowledge, a higher knowledge in Islam, and the subject is the Quran and the moon methodology for reciting the Quran, which is the first step to the second, which is the Quran and the stars methodology for study of the Quran. So let us begin with Allah's blessed name and uh, direct our attention to knowledge and the system of education in our civilization and what Dajjal is doing, what is the danger which he presents to us. Our Prophet said, Sallallahu Ta'ala Alaihi Wasallam, he said, teach the child from infancy until the age of seven. Teach the child with love. That is the teacher, to teach with love. And he said from age 7 until age 14, teach the child by disciplining the child, establishing firm habits in the child hmm? that will remain with the child all through his or her life. Like the most important one of all, is to perform your salat regularly. The most important one of all is to recite the Quran every day. Eventually, at the age of 10, you would be reciting the whole Quran from cover to cover once a month. This is the second stage. And he said, after the child passes the age of 14, you cannot teach the child other than, become, than by becoming a friend. By becoming a friend of the child. This is the psychology of education that has come from Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam. If we are 
to teach with love from childhood until age seven. Then the child has to grow up in the arms of love. The child has to grow up in a stable home where love will be shown. And so Allah gives us a social system of the relationship between the male and the female, which makes sense for the home to be a stable home, to be a happy home, and for the child to grow up in the arms of security and of happiness. If Allah has blessed me today to have this profile around the world as a scholar of Islam, when I was born in a little island in the Caribbean, just off the coast of Venezuela, far, far, far removed from the world of Islam. If this has become possible in my life, it's because I started off in a happy home. I started off in a stable home with father and mother and children living together in a unit, a stable unit. I never had a part-time mother Oh my gosh, Imran, now you're going on the wrong road. This is the road to trouble, huh? <laughs> but I don't care two peanuts. I don't care two peanuts for those who cannot stomach the truth. I'm not here to preach Islam to please them. Who do they think they are? It doesn't matter to me how many they may be. And it doesn't matter to me what are the consequences of my proclaiming the truth. If I cannot proclaim the truth, tell me so, and I leave your dictatorship, and I go somewhere else where there is freedom. The most important thing of all for me is freedom. So tell me, when I no longer have freedom, I pack my bags and leave. But so long as I have freedom, I must proclaim the truth. I never had a part-time mother. My mother was at home, full-time. And that meant a lot in the psychology of education of the child. It gives to the child a certain internal security <coughs> and uh, the maintenance of an internal balance that is not disturbed. But when a child grows up in a broken home <laughs> and when <laughs> Christmas time comes, he goes to the supermarket to buy Christmas cards and he looks for one for mummy and her husband. And he looks for another one for daddy and his wife. Can you imagine the heart of that child? Christmas is coming. This is for them the greatest time of the year in this country. That child is growing up with a broken heart because that child came from a broken home. So if you want to damage a person, destroy him, destroy him as a child and he'll grow up to be a gangster he'll grow up to take drugs he'll become violent using firearms and he'll enter into the world of promiscuity and the child is only 14 and she already has her first abortion uh, they say no 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 you can't get married until you're 18 that's haram. 
But it's okay to have your first abortion at 14. And then the second abortion at 15. This is the destruction of the human being. And so our first, first uh, 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 argument for proper education and therefore for the construction of the house of knowledge is to try to ensure that the child grows up with love. Mm. And love means love in a home, a family. The, the one who created every human being and who created the water that we drink and who created the food that we eat and who created the air that we breathe and who gives us the light of the day and the darkness of the night this is the one who says that he created the male and the female the way he created the night and the day he says so in the Quran and so night and day are like male and female they complement each other they are two halves that come together to make a whole and uh, the day has its functions to perform. Allah says, masha," And I gave you the day so you can work and toil. libasa," And I gave you the night for a different purpose. That you can have rest in the night. So they are functionally different. Similarly, the man and the woman, the male and the female, are functionally different. And it's when father and mother fulfill their functions as male and female, as father and mother, that you can have a stable home and therefore a stable society. But when you come with this greatest achievement, of modern Western civilization, which uh, informs me, Imran, this is the greatest civilization it has ever been the good fortune of mankind to witness. And uh, this civilization has come to replace all that came before it. Every civilization that came before this civilization is now the language that Toynbee used in his book Civilization and Trial. He said moribund <laughs> and obsolete. He says they have all been relegated to the museums of history, including Islamic civilization. Sounds like arrogance to me. And the greatest achievement of this civilization, and they cannot stop me from saying it, no, is for a man to marry another man and get a marriage certificate. But is Western civilization's greatest achievement? But even a fool would understand that you are disrupting the complementary roles of the male and the female. The, the, the family unit is being destroyed. The home is no longer going to be the home as Allah has arranged. And so the child who grows up in that broken home and the child who grows up in this bogus home is going to be a child who eventually will end up in a mental asylum. Disoriented. And so we begin the process of education by returning to the home that Allah has ordained and uh, returning to the marital relationship that Allah has ordained. He gave to the father certain functional roles and I'm not allowed to talk about it now. And he gave to the mother certain functional roles and the modern feminist woman comes with a sword in her hand. Stop it! Don't talk about it! 
And our response is, get lost, who are you? We are scholars of Islam, we've come to preach, who are you to stop us? It doesn't matter to me if you're a Pakistani woman, you know, the modernized one. And uh, Allah gave us marriage, a system of marriage, which gives you a stable home. And when, uh, when uh, a girl reached the age of puberty, puberty, now she can become pregnant. Only now does she qualify to be married, not before. To marry a girl who has not reached the age of puberty, you should be sent on a one-way ticket to Mars. Huh? You want to marry a girl who is only six years of age? Send them on a one-way ticket to Mars. But in addition to that, Allah speaks about rushed. A certain measure of maturity, not a PhD from MIT. And when once the girl has this age, she has reached the age of puberty, and she has the measure of maturity, so she can handle the home, the finances of the home. She's, she's now, according to Allah's wisdom, she's ready for marriage. But today's world says we are more learned and intelligent than the Lord God himself. That's the brainwashing that we have to live with today. And so if you accept that, no, 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 she must reach the age of 18 before she can be married. You're wasting your time listening to me. We reject that. But when uh, Dajjal sends the order, every single government in the whole world, including the world of Islam, have to enact legislation. I don't know if Pakistan did it. Prohibiting marriage before she reaches the age of 18. What happens when girls get married early? We have early marriage. This has always been in all civilizations in history until the Dajjal took over the world. Answer, you had more stable families. The marriages lasted and you had bigger families and people lived a happier life. And in this age of progress, yes, this the best age ever with the, West, the best civilization it has ever been the good fortune of mankind to witness. Nearly every marriage is ending up in divorce. They meet each other and they pledge eternal love. And eternity lasts for six weeks. <laughs> six months. And then it's his lawyer and her lawyer taking over. So is this progress? If we want to bring back education and reconstruction of the house of knowledge, we have to restore the stable home. And to restore the stable home, we've got to go back to the relationship between the male and female, and I don't have the time today to expand on this subject, but this is under attack around the world today. The relationship between the male and female in society and the role of women in society. The role of women in society. And as a consequence of this modernist thinking, the jazz modern feminist revolution we are now in this state of debacle. When the child is in that early stage, up to the age of seven, the most important thing to be done in the process of education is to build the memory. If you build a vast memory bank, if I may be allowed to use that term, then that child can eventually emerge with an amazing versatility. 
he would not only become a medical doctor, he might also have uh, uh, engineering, he could have philosophy, he could have all these other subjects. What is the, the sky is the limit when you build the memory bank. And so we began education in Islam by trying intelligently so, sensibly so, to build the memory bank of the child, that the child would memorize and memorize and memorize. If the child is memorizing poetry, Urdu poetry, well, still it has some benefit. But if the child is memorizing the Quran, MashaAllah, and so this is what we did at that age, building the memory bank. And along comes Dajjal, and today I was lecturing in a, in a place called Jambar in Java in Indonesia, maybe about two, three months ago. And there were about a thousand students ranging from age 10 to age 15, 16. And I am dress, addressing them every morning after Fajr and every night after Maghrib, 1,000 or more. And it went on for about maybe 10, two weeks. So I said, all those who have a smartphone, put your hands up. And everybody put their hand up. I say, all those who don't have a smartphone, put your hands up. Maybe one or two who are too poor. In this country of such great poverty, every child already had a smartphone. And what is a smartphone doing to that child? Depriving the child of what could have been a chance for him to build his memory base at that early age. Because he's wasting his time with the smartphone. Dajjal is very sensible, very intelligent. He plans cunningly. And uh, we are now experiencing something else. That as the child is subjected to the electromagnetic waves coming from the cell phone and the wireless internet and the cell phone towers and so on and the smartphone his memory is being damaged check it out I checked it out I take a, a group of little girls seven eight years of age in an Islamic camp and I said come let's see this is the name of the first surah. This is the name of the second and the third and the fourth and the fifth, only five. Al-Fatiha, Al-Baqarah, Ali Imran, and Nisa, Al-Ma'ida. Now go, walk about, repeat it, come back after five minutes. They couldn't remember. They couldn't remember. The only ones who showed signs that the memory was still powerful are those who were not using the smartphone. When the child is in that age, the early age, he needs to be going outside and playing and jumping and running in the flower garden, enjoying the flowers. And if instead of that the child is hooked <laughs> with a smartphone or a laptop, you are you're denying something else to the child. The process of education is that you not only begin with the memory, but you move on from the memory to something, oh my gosh, it is so beautiful. Something that Allah gave to us. Something called the imagination to build castles in the sky. Imagination. And the imagination of the child is triggered off 
by observing the signs of Allah externally. Nabi Muhammad والسلام, once came to the masjid in the morning weeping. He said two, two verses of the Quran, two passages came down last night. And they were so powerful in my heart that I could not help weeping, weeping of this. And uh, in Surah Ali Imran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks and he says, بَعَدَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ إِنَّ فِي خَلْكِ السَّمَوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَاخْتِلَافِ اللَّيْلِ وَالنَّهَارِ لَآيَاتِ لِأُولِ الْأَلْبَابِ That surely in everything that there is in Allah's creation, in the samawat and the earth, the material universe, there are signs, there are pages, to be read. There are pages to be read. Pages written by Allah. But in order for you to read those pages, you got to go out. You got to go amongst the flowers. You have to watch the river. You have to look up at the stars and the moon and the sun. You have to feel the breeze and look at the clouds. You have to look at the birds and then the child's imagination is triggered off and the child now begins to read pages written by Allah. But you deny that to the child by taking him away from the trees and the flowers and he's hooked to that, you know it, in every, in every house, in every room of every house now, the television set. And the only way father and mother could get some time for themselves is put the television on. And the children are hooked to watch television. And in the process, they are robbed. Robbed of being able to interact with nature. This was what the prophets was key, was weeping about. And the Quran went on to say about those who observe and read the pages of nature that Allah has written. He calls them Ulil Albab. Allah goes on to say that when you read the pages of the book of nature and your imagination is fired off like this, they are eventually going to become a people of zikr. الَّذِينَ يَذْكُرُونَ اللَّهَ قِيَامًا وَقُعُودًا وَعَلَى جُنُوبِهِمْ And so the, the examination and enjoyment of the external phenomena in the universe is meant to lead to some internal reaction in the heart of remembrance of Allah and after the child is triggered off for this zikr of Allah in the heart and father and mother playing a role in this then comes another a higher stage when now the child engages in thinking first there was memory and then there was the imagination and now there is thinking وَيَتَفَكَّرُونَ فِي خَلْكِ السَّمَوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ And the child is now engaged in critical thinking of everything in the heavens and the earth. And would you believe that this is possible at age 14? Yes. Uh, my father was a school principal. May Allah have mercy on his soul. And uh, he did not marry until he was age 40. He was waiting for someone, uh, but it did not work. He waited and waited and waited for her. And then he said, I can't wait anymore. And then he went to the head of our Muslim community. He said, find me a wife. And that's how he married my mother. But during this time when he was working up to the age of 40, he would use his income 
and bought, buy books. And he had an excellent library. Uh, and uh, he chose the books. For, a lot of the books were imported from abroad. And my father never knew. He never knew it. He died when I was 15. And he died without knowing that when I was 12, from the age of 12, I would go down into his library. He would not know about it. And I would be reading these books on Islamic philosophy. It was a little difficult for me, the one on Islamic philosophy. But the books on Islamic history, they fired off my imagination. I went traveling all over the place while reading these books. And that was the age of 12 and 13 and 14. When he died at 15, he never knew what I was doing in his library. And so the imagination was built up at that time, reading these books. When you reach to the other stage now, you have built a bank, a memory bank that is formidable. You have built up your imagination with the study, for example, of history. The battles fought long ago and this and that and the other. In these also, there are pages written by Allah, not just in the flowers and the birds and the mountains and the rivers, but also in history. And so when I went to Pakistan now to study, I went to Al Azhar first at the age of 21. Uh, but at the age of 18, uh, Maulana, Fadlur, Maulana Muhammad Fadlur Rahman Ansari of Pakistan, he came to Karachi. Uh, I came to Trinidad. I was only 18 years of age. And my father insisted I had to go to the best college in the country. The best college in the country. And... Uh, when this Maulana came to Trinidad, he, he was going to come to my village masjid to speak on Islam and science. I said, what nonsense is this? What connection could there be between Islam and science? What is this man going to come to talk about? I was skeptical. <laughs> but when he started to speak, I, my mouth was open. And it remained open all to the end, up to the end of the lecture. It took one lecture from a learned scholar of Islam, one, to change me. Because I had the background already. I could witness immediately, this is scholarship. <coughs> and from that day, when I first listened to him, the desire was there in my heart for rising in the house of knowledge. And so, when I went to Al Azhar at the age of 21, I couldn't find anyone there with that kind of scholarship that he had. And so I left Al Azhar and I went to study with him in Pakistan. And that was the best decision I ever took in my entire life. After studying with him and building up my critical faculties of thought and introducing me to the Quran, and introducing me to how to study the Quran, I graduated, I went back home with a Pakistani education. Uh, how, could this, how could this compare with an Oxford education? How could this compare with a Cambridge or Sorbonne or Harvard or Yale or MIT? It can't even compare with Kaidi Azam University. A Darul Loom man. <laughs> but this was not an ordinary Darul Loom. This is tomorrow's lecture. So he said to me, when you go back to Trinidad, I don't want you to be a, a Maulana in a masjid and you, you give one bad khutbah to fire you. <laughs> I want you to earn your livelihood independently from your study, from your service to the mission of Islam, which is why I earn my livelihood from writing my books and nobody can fire me. So, 
I applied for a job in the foreign ministry and they interviewed me and they said yes we'd like to have you in the foreign ministry but we want you to go back to university and study international relations. Imran has never studied international politics, Kabhini. Never studied international economics, Kabhini. Never studied international monetary economics, Kabhini. Never studied international law, never studied diplomacy in Islam, never studied history of international relations. No, never studied any of these subjects. And now I'm in the Institute of International Relations, which is a prestigious institute for diplomats from all over the Caribbean. And they're all graduates. You cannot enter this institute unless you are a graduate. And they are graduate from British universities and American universities and French universities and Canadian universities and poor me one Pakistani university. So they're all looking down at me. <coughs> what is he doing here? <laughs> and they're all diplomats, most of them. But more than that, when they heard my profile that I was a scholar of religion, what is this priest doing with us? We are scholars of international relations. We're going to be diplomats of the world. What is this priest doing? It's a square peg in a round hole. Then the classes started. And I was blessed to have as one, my, one of the, the director of the institute was Professor Leslie Manigat from Haiti. And he, had, he did his PhD in the Sorbonne, but he was not a conventional thinker. He was not a conventional thinker. He was anti-systemic in his thought, and he was able to unravel Western civilization and point out its oppression. And when that man started lecturing and teaching me international politics, and the others started teaching me international economics and so on, my eyes opened. I was like a fish in the ocean. I was loving it. And when the question and answer started in the classroom, I was the most intelligent in the class. There was no one even close to me. None. And when the end of the year exams are coming, we have to form small groups, small study groups. Everybody want me in their group. <laughs> At the end of the year, the exams took place. I came first in the exams. The fellow who had the master's degree in economics from the London School of Economics, I beat him. When I never studied economics and politics before entering, what was the difference? The difference was that I grew up in a stable home. I didn't have a part-time mother. I had a father who devoted attention to the school to this, the scholarship of his children, the training and education was a responsible way. I had my father's library that I was reading from age 12. And then I had the master himself, Mawlana Fadlur Rahman Ansari Rahimahullah, teaching me. And I had the Quran, and I had more than that, I had the proper methodology for studying the Quran, which is tomorrow's lecture. And the whole class was left behind. They don't, they're not looking down anymore, the Pakistani education. This is a wake up call for those who believe this is heaven. Britain is heaven. And the British education is the best in the world. And who wants to go back to Pakistan and study in Pakistan? So Nabi Muhammad was weeping that morning when this revelation came down concerning, concerning the study of the external phenomena, the study of the pages of the book of nature that were written, <laughs> written by Allah. <coughs> Let me give you one page before we move on. 
Um, Allah says in Surah An-Nuh, Wallahu ambatakum min al-ardi nabata. And Allah has caused you to grow forth from the earth, like trees and plants. Grow forth from the earth, like trees and plants. And I eventually found myself going for morning walks. That's before I started using the walking stick. I will go for walks in the morning in the valley of Santa Cruz in Trinidad, a beautiful valley. And I'll be observing the trees. And people would be passing by and say, oh, oh, we never thought he would have ended up like this because they find me talking to the trees. <laughs> who is this, who is this madman ta talking to the trees? <laughs> because the trees were speaking to me. I was communicating with the trees at that young age. When Allah says that he has caused us to grow forth from the earth like trees and plants, I had to study the trees. And when I studied the trees, then I began to understand human beings. That we're not all the same. No. In the same way that the trees are not all the same. And this is where the father and the mother and the teacher and the imam have a critical role to play. Because the children are in for them before their eyes and they have to spot. This child is going to grow up as an ornamental tree. This child is going to grow up as a tree from which you will get timber to make furniture. This child is going to grow up to be a tree which will be like an umbrella to provide shade. This child will grow up to be a tree which will be a medicinal tree because the trees are not all the same. And so the Quran led me to aptitude. We are not all the same. Allah has endowed us with different aptitudes, different gifts. And you have to be able to spot what is there in a child and then lead that child up, climb this ladder. This is your ladder. It was very clear from an early age that Allah had blessed me with something called insight. And he gave it to my father as well. And because they spotted, they spotted this in me, that Allah had blessed me with insight. Mawlana Fadl Rahman Ansari as a great teacher was able to build, build on that. Here is an example how by observing the external phenomena, the trees, you're able to learn about human beings. Hmm? Now then, not only does Allah teach us with the book of nature, but after we have reached a certain age, and in my case, by age of 12, 13, 14, I was ready to go at that age. He also teaches us with another book, the pages which he has written. It's called the Book of History. History is not just a story to be read. History is not moving, moving in any direction it chooses to move aimlessly. <coughs> History is not just a record of events, but history also is an interpretation of events. And we must be able to connect the dots of history to be able to understand the direction in which history is moving. Uh, anyone with an elementary study of the movement of history would tell you, this country is a sinking ship. <laughs> Elementary. This ship is sinking. And when it sinks, it will take all on board. Underneath. 
all those on board will go with this when the ship sinks. When you look at the pages of the book of history of this country, this is perhaps the most fascinating country in the whole world, Britain, to study the history of this country. And if you study the history of this country all through, and you do not, you cannot recognize that this ship is sinking, you're blind. <laughs> you're blind. When you study the pages of the book of history, then you're able with insight to connect the dots of history. Tomorrow night, we look and see how Islamic eschatology connects the dots of history and the Darul Loom is incapable of doing that. As you connect the dots of history and you understand the movement of history, you're able to anticipate what's coming tomorrow. That's scholarship. That is scholarship. To be able to anticipate what's coming tomorrow because you penetrated the reality of the world which confronts you today. <coughs> Finally, Allah first taught you as a child with the pages of the book of nature. And then as you grew up to your adolescence and your imagination was fired off, he then taught you with the pages of the book of history. These are the social sciences. But when you reach adult, and when you have been reciting the Quran, which is my lecture on Juma, inshallah, in Leicester, please try to come for that lecture. The Quran and the Moon, methodology for recitation of the Quran. When you've been doing that, then you qualify to study the Quran. And whoever studies the Quran, and is blessed by Allah to penetrate that knowledge in the Quran which explains the world today. That is the only scholar, the only scholar of Akhir Zaman. All the rest are peripherally important. This one is a Khidr. Khidr. And he is located in Surah al Kaf of the Quran. The one who is able to study the Qur'an and locate in the Qur'an that which explains the reality of the world today. And then find in the Qur'an the guidance with which to respond. That is the scholar. I don't know much of the Urdu language. And my Urdu pronunciation maybe will get you to laugh a little bit, but never mind. I did memorize one couplet of Iqbal, which is connected with this khidr. <coughs> and what the Darul Ulum is not doing, they're not producing Iqbal's. <laughs> they're not producing khidr. He said, Hazaro saal nargis apni be nuri pe roti hai. Bari mushke se hota hai chaman me di dawar paida. The di dawar is a khidr. The di dawar is the man of insight. Insight. And if we had di dawars, we would not be in the mess in which we are today. Where Modi is Confidently castigating. Look at them, Pakistan begging for money. Beggars. While the Indian economy is growing at a rate that wants to rival the United States. Hmm? And putting us to shame and disgrace. If we had D dollars, we would not be in the pathetic state in which we are today. Uh, if we are to get out of this pathetic state, it's not this Darul Ulum. That's, I'm not waging any boxing match with the Darul Ulum. Tomorrow's lecture, 
I'm not speaking disparagingly about them. All I'm saying is that education is deficient and inadequate. Even more than that, defective. And if you put all your resources in building more and more Darulums, more and more, you have a hundred, you make a thousand in Britain, it's money being wasted. Because not going to change anything. And so, the scholarship that I represent is from my teacher, Maulana Fadur Rahman Ansari. And we are actually involved in changing the house of knowledge in Islam. That's our task. We want to build a new house of knowledge in Islam. To produce a new scholar of Islam, a new model of Islamic scholarship which will be able to, re to turn to the Qur'an and get from the Qur'an that which explains the reality of the world today and get from the, the Qur'an the guidance with which to respond to the predicament that we face today. And uh, this is the country where I can do the work because I don't speak French, although the the terrain in France is very fertile because of the huge number of Algerians out there. And the Algerians are not as complex as the Pakistanis. <laughs> no, the Algerians are not as complex as the Pakistanis. <laughs> so it's easier, it's easier to preach and teach the Algerians. And I don't have the fluency in Arabic to be able to go into Arab world. In fact, I won't survive in the Arab world. No. So I can only do this work in the English-speaking world. If I go to Pakistan to do this, they'll not only shut the doors and must it to me, they shut more than that. <laughs> so I have to do it in Britain and with you. And I'm hoping and praying perhaps from these lectures I'm delivering that we can build a team. That tomorrow, for example, will make a difference for the world of Islam. All right, so I said on Friday, oh, sorry, not Friday, Juma, in Leicester, if you come, we look at the beginning of the process of returning to the Quran, the beginning of the process, to rebuild this house of knowledge. And that is the Quran and the moon, the methodology for reciting the Quran. And you would love it, oh yes, you would love it, you would love it, you would love it, and you'd want your children to apply it. And then on another occasion, Allah knows when, I can turn to the other subject, the Quran and the stars, methodology for studying the Quran. Let us uh, now end with uh, a comment on Dajjal, his mission is to rule the world and to rule the world from Jerusalem, <coughs> rule the world from a holy state of Israel in Jerusalem so that he can proclaim, I am the Messiah. All of this is in my book, uh, Jerusalem in the Quran, which was written 20 years ago. And when he proclaims, I am the Masih, and al Masih, and they all accepting, he will raise, he'll rub his hands and he'll say, mission accomplished. I took them for a ride. <laughs> I took them for a ride. In order for him to achieve this mission of ruling the world, he has to brainwash the world. And the process of brainwashing the world is most dangerous of all in education and knowledge. There is his attack. It's called, it's a branch of knowledge called epistemology. And it is to the, the genius of Dr. Muhammad Iqbal that he recognized this attack that was epistemological. Epistemology is the branch of knowledge which studies knowledge, which studies the sources of knowledge. 
And uh, when Iqbal wrote his uh, reconstruction of religious thought in Islam, he devoted the first two chapters of that book to this subject. That knowledge does not come only from external observation and from experimentation <laughs> and from rational inquiry. That is Dajjal. Dajjal says this is the only road to knowledge. Observation, experimentation and rational inquiry. The Jah goes on to say, if knowledge comes from any other source, it's not knowledge, it should be sent by Federal Express to a place called Disneyland. The Quran says, no, you're wrong. Knowledge comes from two sources, not one. Knowledge comes from external observation, and knowledge comes from internal internal knowledge that is internally received. And in the Quran, in Surah al kaf of the Quran, when Akhiru Zaman comes, the last age, the only scholar who can unravel Akhiru Zaman and make sense of it is the one who is located at Majma'ul Bahrain. What is Majma'ul Bahrain? the places where the two oceans meet. The ocean of knowledge that is externally acquired, you got to do it, the exact sciences, and the ocean of knowledge that is internally received. What the Dajjal did was to concentrate on the external knowledge. And because he has the jinn with him, and this is in the Quran, this is in the Quran. Read my book. Uh, we don't have it at the back. It's coming. It should arrive in Britain in a week or so. Uh, Dajjal, the Quran, and the Jasad. If you read that book, you see the link between Dajjal and the Jinn. He's able to bring about a scientific and technological revolution in the exact sciences, which which leaves the rest of mankind spellbound. Spellbound. And uses this as the honey to trap the rest of mankind. And the scientific and technological revolution is so powerful that every time it takes a step, it changes the whole world. Nobody uses horses and donkeys anymore and mules to transport goods and so on. You have the train now. You have the bus, you have the motor car, you have the aeroplane. This is what the Jal has done, okay? He also brings about a revolution in manufacturing, the industrial revolution, and this country is the heart of it, from Manchester. He changes the market with riba, <laughs> and he sucks the wealth of mankind. It's actually stealing the wealth of mankind through a monetary system and a banking system and amasses the wealth of the world in this civilization and leave the rest of the world poor and destitute. And then people start coming to Dajjal for his bread. That's what our prophet said. They will follow him for his bread. Hmm? This is just a glimpse of the subject of the job. He brings the feminist revolution to transform the world of women. And as he transforms the world of women, the family falls apart. <laughs> and children become children of broken homes. And as a result, they grow up with broken individuals. He gives you television. And the images on the television screen keeps on moving rapidly, 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 rapidly. Why? Why is he putting this, the images on the television screen in rapid change? Because he wants to destroy your capacity to think. 
And for, last of all, before I end, our Prophet said, alayhi salatu was salam, that in the end time, time will move faster and faster. A whole year will pass, and it would appear to have been just a month. And a whole month, like a week, and a whole week, like a day, and a whole day, like an hour, and a whole hour, like the amount of time it takes to kindle a fire. And when I ask my audiences around the world, and I travel extensively, put your hands up if you are experiencing time moving faster and faster. Everybody put their hands up. In Newport, only the, the Maulana sitting next to me. I said, Mashallah, then the Maulana put his hands up. <laughs> so everybody put their hands up. And I have to say to them, once you are experiencing time moving faster and faster, you have, you are in danger. You are in danger. Your heart is not beating in harmony with the rest of Allah's creation. That is why you are experiencing time moving faster and faster. But uh, uh, in Leicester we will be able to take up this subject. Once you experience time moving faster and faster, you can't become a thinker. <laughs> you cannot become a thinker, a mufakkir much less a deed hour, because you'll only be shallow in your thinking, shallow. So I say, take the television set and throw it out of the house. You don't need it. Take away the smartphone from your children, <laughs> because now they're giving them homework and you have to use your smartphone to do the homework. That is the jazz plan. And send your children out, let them play in the in the garden, play in the parks, let them talk with the trees, let them play with the animals, okay? Build the memory bank, build the imagination of the child, you would be amazed at what a child can do. And, and the mother's lap is the first school. We pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bless, may bless her, Faisal for having the, the, the insight to choose this topic and we pray that you may be of benefit from today's uh, lecture mm -hmm. and this may make a difference for you and for your children. Rabbana taqabal minna inna ka inta samir alim wa tuba alina ya mulana inna ka inta tawab rahim. Barahmatika ya arham ar-rahimin. Ameen.